kaleidoscope perception. Good morning. I just woke up and felt inspired to make this video on the topic of narcissism and codependency. They're probably words that you've heard talked about a lot. Um, and there's a lot of misperceptions about what they mean. Um, and they're often, at least narcissism is often used as a criticism. Um, and so its meaning has been kind of lost. And I'm also of the perspective that if you, um, if you're not um, one with codependent tendencies, or if you've never met um, someone who fits the narcissistic tendencies, or you've never seen someone being codependent, you might not really understand what it is. So I wanted to offer my firsthand experience of these terms and how they have tremendously helped me, because I think the point of these terms isn't to place blame, it's not to confuse us, it's because they're tools. Um, so just in case this is new to you, or in case my story can offer you something of benefit, I felt called to share. So I'm going to put this in terms of um, growing up with a narcissistic authority figure or parent. Um, a lot of what's talked about when I hear the terms of narcissism and codependent, it's in terms of romantic relationships. Um, and I'm going to talk about how my experience of codependency came about through um, a parent with narcissistic tendencies and how tremendous of a revolution has come about for me having this awareness. So an example of narcissistic behavior is um, we were at a jump circle, at a fire circle, and someone was leading a song and on drum. Um, and, and there was a woman who was singing and she was singing freely and expressively and he just stopped the song and said to her, um, with a very angry tone, you're singing out of tune, you're behaving childlike, um, he started calling her names. So if someone grows up being told when they are expressing themselves, being repeatedly told, you're bad at that, you're bad at expressing yourself, you're bad at um, your creative self-expression, who you are is wrong, it's childlike, it's stupid, you'll never fit in, you'll never be successful in the world if you follow that route, if you do those things, if you behave in that way, if you dress that way, if you look that way, if you have those friends, um, you will be judged by me and you won't be successful. So if, um, so someone with narcissistic tendencies, the classic narcissist is one who does not self-reflect, right? So in that moment, when he stopped the song and started saying those things to this woman, um, he didn't recognize, oh, something that she's doing is triggering something in me. My upset right now is mine. Um, and I think, from my perspective, it, it felt sort of like a power play, like he felt dominated by her, and he said to her, you're dominating the whole circle, you're singing out of tune, um, and he didn't self-reflect and see, hmm, what's going on in me right now, why do I feel triggered? Instead, he really f genuinely felt or spoke, you're doing something wrong to someone else, he projected, instead of Recognizing he was triggered, self-reflecting, he projected and did it with a lot of authority and power and, um, and like, anger, like, a power. And she started crying. Um, and so, yeah, and so, so the narcissistic, and, and when I use the word, I don't want to say someone is a narcissist, period. Someone is a codependent, period. I... I want to say these are the behaviors and the tendencies and what's going on internally for them. Um, but for the sake of just saying it quickly, I'm going to say the narcissist. But know that I'm not labeling someone as though this is what they are, absolutely. Um, so 
the narcissist has such a strong sense of themselves. And by that, I mean their opinions of the world, their opinions of other people, their opinions of right and wrong. In a given moment, he knew that for some reason he didn't like what she was doing and he wasn't afraid to let everyone know. And um, so a very strong sense um, of who I am, what I'm about, what I'm doing, um, not really much self-doubt, not much self-reflection, um, and, and my, as a narcissist, my, um, my sense of self is so strong that it overpowers my ability to perceive where they're coming from or what their interests are. If their interests or their perception of the world is different than mine, I'm not really going to understand it. I'm going to think it's probably just flat out stupid or wrong, um, because it's different than mine. Um, okay. So if someone grows up and their sense of self is developing, or they're being raised by someone who is very different from them and has a very different idea of um, how someone should behave and look and act and what what is valuable in life and what is a good friend, then... Um, and if these things in the narcissist's perspective and opinion are very different than what they see in their child's behavior, they're going to let their child know you're doing it wrong. Um, you shouldn't be going down that avenue. You should be doing this. Um, you're not really good at that. I don't really like it when you do that. I don't like it when you dress this way. Your friends are losers. Um, <laughs> and I'm just laughing because I was told that growing up. So... The child who hears this around adolescence and around the time that they're getting to discover who am I, what are what is my unique worldview, what are my gifts, what do I like doing, who do I like hanging out with, how do I want to look, um, who do I want to be, what are my values, what do I care about in the world, what am I passionate about, when they're repeatedly told by someone who they are giving their authority to they're going to have a weak sense of self. They're going to feel very confused and they're going to feel like, gosh, I'm living life wrong. I'm doing it wrong. No one likes me. Um, I'm never going to be successful in the world. I'm never going to be able to make money doing what I love. Um, no one else does the things that I want to do. I feel alone and like a failure. <laughs> they're going to have a very small sense of self and they're going to start getting confused. Um, my experience of developing codependency was a lot of um, cognitive dissonance. I, I became so detached from my basic needs at a certain point that I was telling myself that it doesn't matter what I do. Um, I was in college and I just, it wasn't right for me at that time. I didn't know what I was doing there. I didn't really have friends there. And I was so detached from what I was doing that I told myself, it doesn't matter. I was spiritual bypassing. Spiritual bypassing can be a great way to um, deal with cognitive dissonance. I had this perspective that doing doesn't matter, just being. It doesn't matter what I do in the world. Um, it just matters that I am present for all of it or something like that. Um, and so I stayed through college and then when I graduated, I said, I'm never doing that again. I'm living my life. And so I did, I went off and I did my unique passion. Um, but still there was a lot of disconnection from my own needs and my sense of self and boundaries. I want to pause. I mentioned this before, um, authority. So it is necessary that one who, in order to, um, like, take on codependent tendencies, it's not that anyone who was raised by a narcissist will become a codependent because maybe don't um, give much authority to the parent and doesn't care what they say, even though they're saying you're doing it wrong and they're judging and they're criticizing and they're projecting their worldview onto their child. Maybe if, um, if the children aren't giving that authority to the parent to say they know better than I do about me, then um, then they then they're good. They probably won't 
feel the effects of narcissistic abuse. And I know me saying those words like kind of sounds like a big deal, but just becoming aware of, oh, that's what happened for me was like a, a tremendous like thank you, like a click in my mind. Um, so, so yes, giving away authority is key to this happening, not having much validation around me of who I am or much, um, like I took my dad totally seriously. What's interesting in these relationships is that they can be, like, I'd say that my dad was genuinely coming from a place of wanting what was best for me. I'd say that he always genuinely had that intention. Um, and that his perception of the right way to live life is just very completely different worlds than mine was. And so the effects were there, regardless of his intention, regardless of his well intention. So then when the codependent um, has a, not a very strong sense of who am I and what do I mean by that St sense of self? I mean, on the level of, well, I kind of listed it already, but like likes and dislikes even, like what, what do I enjoy? What am I good at? Um, how do I want to spend my time? What's valuable to me? What's important to me? What am I passionate about? What does my creative expression look like? How do I like to dress? Who do I like to hang out with? Um, and so it's, that's what I mean by sense of self. What, what are the characteristics of codependency? The first thing we'll hear a lot about is losing yourself. And what does that mean? So if someone who does not have a strong sense of self gets together with someone who does have a strong sense of self, they might just get confused about who they are about every subtle thing. Oh yeah, the other thing I was gonna say was detachment from needs and codependency. There is in a moment to moment frame um, confusion about what do I need. So, um, so like for me, the way that this would take form is someone who I like hanging out with and they're probably maybe someone I'm close to even, um, and they'll say to me, do you want to hang out? And I just flat out cannot tell. I'm just detached from my sense, my gauge of what I want and what I need. It most often happens in terms of whether or not I want to be alone or hang out. And it happens because I'll feel as though even when I'm not around someone, if I've been around them a lot or if I'm very close to this person, that I have, like, lo I, my sense of myself, I, I don't have as easy access to it. I'm not as in touch with it. Um, so I might, and it's a very, like, visceral experience. So I'm going to see if I can describe it better. If you click on the link below, it'll take you to an article on my website where I elaborate on what I talked about here, and I also describe more of the symptoms of what codependency feels like. But it feels as though there's something in me that I don't have access to in terms of making decisions about what I want to do, whether I want to hang out with this person, and what my boundaries are with this person, what type of relationship I want to be in in this person. It's like there's a sensitivity to what the other person feels that can override our own feelings. Um, and, and, you know, sometimes it might be our perceived, our perception of what the other person feels or needs in a given moment, but, some, but just as often I'd say it is genuinely such a deep sensitivity to the other person that it overrides us. And that sensitivity is cultivated because if we're raised by someone who's narcissistic, then anytime we do something that they don't like, we're going to get criticized, punished. Um, so we have cultivated a sensitivity to what the person who we are giving authority to feels to make sure that we can receive what we need as a child or what we need in terms of love or what we need in terms of approval or validation, we will do, um, we will become the other person so that they'll like us. <laughs> um, and this, this happens, I mean, at this point, I am pretty conscious of when it's happening inside of me. 
Um, but it, I've seen until recently, I've seen it operate in my behavior. And even still, when I have been conscious of it, um, operate in my behavior unconsciously, unconsciously playing into, um, someone else, what they're putting off. It can look like if you have been in a relationship with a codependent, it can feel as though you've been led on and that sucks <laughs> for everyone. And, um, the experience that the codependent is having is what is confusion is just outright l- being out of touch with their own center. Um, and sort of feeling a vulnerability, um, so that they feel like if they are even in touch with their own needs and their sense of center, and if they express them to you, they will be invalidated and punished and judged and criticized and you will leave them. And so you have to, so they have to fit. (laughs) The sun is so pretty. So they have to mold to their perception of what you want of them, even if that means being in a relationship with you or making you think that they want to be when they actually don't feel that way. So sense of boundaries is way off. And by boundaries, I mean, um, this is who I am. I mean, a sense of self. I mean, someone who is has healthy boundaries knows what they want. In a relationship, they know what they need in life. They know who they are. They know what they value. And, um, and they know how they feel moment to moment. They can say, um, mm, I'm not up for that right now. Um, and they can say, no, I don't want to share that right now. Um, they have a sense of boundaries. Okay, yeah. So the other thing I'll say is someone, um, when in terms of boundaries, I've seen myself and others when learning to set healthy boundaries, when in a healing process and coming back to our sense of self, um, can then act kind of narcissistically. It'll take that form because what happens is that when we have been so out of touch as codependents with ourselves, and then we start feeling, um, ourselves, (laughs) then it seems as though, We so desperately need to prioritize our needs um, that we can neglect others' needs, and that's bad for relationships. Um, And so for the recovering codependent, there's a period of getting back into the sense of self and then learning that it is safe to consider the other um, when expressing needs and when expressing boundaries. And learning to balance and discern when is it appropriate for me to say no to someone and to just take care of myself, and when is it appropriate that I take someone else's feeling into consideration so that I don't swing to the pendulum side of narcissist in order to protect myself, in order to make sure that I'm in touch with my needs. I mean, I wouldn't call it narcissist because the codependent is um, probably over self-reflective because there's a lot of self-doubt. But by narcissist, in terms of the codependent swinging to the opposite end, I mean in terms of behavior that is overlooking the other person's needs. And um, But in the codependent, that comes from a place of being protective of their sense of self and their own needs. And the narcissist, that be, that comes from a place of feeling the sense of self more strongly than they feel others' needs naturally. They just feel it so strongly that what anyone else says is like stupid or like, how could you be different than me? Like, I know what is right. And then the codependent, when they behave narcissistically, meaning when they take actions that don't consider others is coming from a place of um I need for my needs to be met so badly 
um, and they haven't been met for so long that I need to protect them. And that might mean me giving permission to myself to hurt other people. Because sometimes when I say no to people, it hurts them. I'm going to throw in another word. This is getting long. <laughs> um, I'm going to throw in the word abandonment. Because then when a person who, and boundaries, and this is probably a whole nother topic. But um, when a person, because, <clears throat> so we just talked about the codependent narcissistic play where the, where the narcissist has um, a very strong sense of self and um, a lot of authority and the codependent um, allow, like, gives away their authority um, to others and has a, not a very strong sense of their needs in a moment and their, who they are. Um, so the codependent, when they're learning about their sense of self and their needs, they might feel like they need to set more boundaries than <clears throat> they really do need to set in order to protect themselves, in order to practice boundary setting, in order to affirm their needs to themselves. And when they are in the company of someone who has healthy boundaries, when they say, um, I just need to take space alone. Then the person with healthy boundaries will say, okay. And that will be good for um, the person working on their boundary setting. But if a person who is learning to set boundaries and be in touch with their needs is with someone then who has like abandonment issues, um, another helpful tool um, to be aware of is this term, then they'll say, hey, I need to just take space for myself. And the person with abandonment issues might project onto them, you need to like care more about me. And that might have the effect for the codependent of them feeling guilty, just feeling punished for expressing their needs and setting their boundaries. And so that's why someone who's learning to set boundaries when they're in relation with someone who has abandonment issues might be under the impression that to set a boundary or to say no to someone means hurting them and that they need to be okay with hurting someone in order for their needs to be met and in order for their boundaries to be honored. So the point I'm trying to make is that there is discernment to be learned through boundary setting. The need for that has come about through from the narcissist being told your needs are unimportant you don't have these needs, um, and then from being in a relationship with someone with abandonment issues, um, when you set boundaries, it hurts me. So there's a learning process of how to balance my needs being met with discerning. And when I set a boundary and someone's going to react with hurt to it, um, cultivating a sense of what is reasonable. And if they're not of the in a discernment that oh this person just has abandonment issues um then they might like even further fall into being out of touch with their needs or over setting boundaries excessively to protect their needs so this is why recognition this is why um, these terms kind of like as diagnoses or just the awareness of them is so valuable because if you're someone who's codependent and you can identify, oh, that person is behaving narcissistically towards me when they're saying to me, you're singing out of tune, you're a terrible singer, you're taking over the circle, no one wants to hear you sing, you're acting childish, um, and they can recognize, oh, that has nothing to do with me, that's that person's uh, projections, then they're good. That's it. Their authority is within themselves. They're not giving authority to what this person has to say. They can recognize, oh, that's just um, someone who's projecting onto me because something I triggered something in them and um, they don't know how to look at it. Okay, that has nothing to do with me and I can even maybe have compassion for um, the tools that they lack that now I have. Um, and so in the same way, when a codependent is learning to set boundaries and they can recognize <coughs> someone who has abandonment issues, um, 
when they say to them, hey, I just I just need some time alone, and then they're told you're being selfish, um, you don't ever consider me, you just want to be alone all the time, and they can see like, okay, that's just because that person it feels triggered by my boundaries. Um, if I set this boundary with anyone else, someone else who has healthy boundaries, they would say, okay, go do your own thing. You be you. We'll hang out whenever you feel open to it. And that would like validate my sense of that I can have my needs met, that others can meet my needs. So, so this recognition is so useful <clears throat> to someone who is a weakened sense of self of what's going on in others so that from our place of inner authority, we can say, oh, this has nothing to do with me. That's just something that I've triggered in them. And I'm just going to do what I need to do for myself. I'm going to make sure my needs are met. And so with this discernment, we can see where I might have a need. But if I'm close to someone and they have a need, um, it might be a priority in that moment. If it's a really emotionally charged situation for them. Um, and normally, I could um, set a boundary or say, no, I'm just taking time to myself or no, this is important to me. I'm just going to do it my way. We can cultivate discernment that, um, someone else's needs are also important and we can have that balance of self and other. It'll feel really vulnerable to not play into what the other person wants and to not um, weaken your sense of self in a way that strengthens theirs um, and to not obscure yourself with someone else, which I realize is like kind of simplistic thing to say because that just like happens. Um, but to be aware of when we feel out of touch with our sense of center and to share that with the other person to be aware that we feel confused in our sense of self and what we want and what we need um, and to be aware of and allowing that sense of vulnerability that it, the, the vulnerability is if I express my needs are you going to leave me are you going to judge me are my needs going to be met or are they just going to be criticized and laughed at? If I express um, who I am, are you still going to like me? <laughs> um, if I, ex if, I um, if I am in touch with my own needs, will this relationship still be alive? Will I still receive the validation I'm getting from this relationship? If I am in touch, not even communicating, first of all, the codependent needs to be able to be in touch with what they need and feel. And then if I'm communicating my needs, it feels like the other person might just leave. And so I need to just let that vulnerability be there and communicate needs. I think that's everything. Everything I can think of is probably a lot more. So I hope you found this useful. I hope you can... See that these words are tools. If you know anyone who exhibits these tendencies, um, you'll find this useful. If you don't know anyone, it might not make sense or it might sound like everyone does that. Um, so, <laughs> all right, thank you. Kaleidoscope perception.